Squirtle, the Tiny Turtle Pokemon, Wartortle, the Turtle Pokemon, and Blastoise, the Shellfish Pokemon. Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional, and I hope you are too. In today's video, we will be seeing how quickly I can defeat Pokemon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite 4, using only my starter, whom I will allow to evolve. Challenge rules are in the description. As always, it was the Water-type starter that I was most excited to play. Squirtle has been my starter of choice ever since I first started playing this game in Pokemon Blue. To fit in with how old my love of this Pokemon is, I had to nickname him with an equally old love. I choose the nickname Roshi after Master Roshi because we both wear awesome shells on our back. For nature, I've chosen Mild, increasing our special attack and decreasing our defense. I chose this because we don't have any physical weaknesses during the run. Remember, in Generation 3, it's a move's typing that determines whether it's physical or special. I felt our special attack needed a little bit of love as our only boosting move is going to be Rain Dance. Roshi's going to be relying on his natural type coverage and awesome raw potential. The rival in the lab falls and we have a very clear-cut path to Brock. At level 7, we learn Bubble, which will benefit from the same type attack bonus, or Stab. As a water move, this boasts a double type advantage over both of Brock's Pokémon. This means that including Stab against his Rock types, we're essentially going to be hitting for 6 times damage. As such, I may have been a little overconfident, shooting straight through the forest and making a beeline to our first gym leader. That overconfidence definitely shows, as I did not heal before entering this battle. Bubble does fantastic damage against Brock's Pokémon, but as a result of not healing, Geodude knocks us down to only 8 health. We heal back to 12 as we level up twice, but it seems that 12 HP is still within knockout range of Onyx's Rock Tomb. Let's try this again, shall we? In the next attempt, after using one of those incredibly rare potions that I've just picked up off the ground, we see a successful battle. Because our speed is only 16, Onyx will not prioritize using Rock Tomb until we're in range of knockout again. He'll use a couple of tackles, but Bubble wins us the day. We collect our first gym badge, heading towards Mount Moon next. I'm not taking the time to knock out any additional trainers on the way through the cave, leveling up to 16 and evolving into our second form, Wartortle. Roshi's just doing Roshi things, as with that giant tail we can now peacock about. I just hope that our nose doesn't start bleeding by Erica's gym. Then on the other side of the cave, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil. That's right, we gotta stick with the blue Abba Dee Abba Die theme. Then, in keeping with our awesome fighting abilities, I'm making sure to teach both Mega Punch and Mega Kick on the other side of the cave. We have the flexibility for both on our moveset right now, and I definitely want some higher damage against the Bulbasaur and Starmie in our future. After a quick stop to heal once we arrive in Cerulean City, I decide to target our second gym leader, Misty, next. Against her lead Staryu, I decided to go straight for Mega Kick as she goes for a Harden. Looking at the damage that we did on that first shot after the Harden, I was doubting that Roshi would get the two-shot, but we do! Then against the more powerful star me, I decided to stick with Mega Kick again, taking three to knock her out. With only 75% accuracy, hitting all five of those in a row was awesome. We take down star me, leveling up to 19 and learning Bite. Bite also would have been quite effective against Starmie, but eh, I guess we didn't need it today. I get rid of Tackle, and upon beating her, we also get TM3 Water Pulse, which is going to replace Water Gun. Let's hope that these upgrades help against Rival 2. Along with an increase in base power of 40 to 60, Water Pulse also comes with a 30% chance to confuse our target. We start the battle against Pidgeotto, launching one and getting the confusion, and Bird Brains hits itself. Well, that's the best case scenario as Bulbasaur comes out and both of our Mega Kicks connect. He even went for Razor Leaf instead of Sleep Powder. This was the best case scenario in this battle. Obviously still in green health, Abra is free and then Rattata is an easy cleanup. Honestly, in this entire run, this was one of the battles that I was most scared for. Getting through it in a single attempt sure feels good. I decided against pulling down Camper Flint for secret power this time, as I didn't feel that the time investment would be worth it. We're picking up some upgrades on the SSN, after all. I'm grabbing Rest if we need it later in the run, and a couple of healing items, as well as more importantly, TM31 Brick Break. I then delete Mega Punch in favor of Brick Break, heading towards Rival 3. Bird Brains is just not having it in this run, as I lead with Water Pulse again, this time getting a critical and taking him out in a single shot. 
This time though, Ivysaur does put us to sleep and we sit there snoozing away as he hits us with a whole bunch of stab super effective vine whips. Yeah, that's why the Bulbasaur line is scary in the early game. In the next attempt, we see a completely different scenario play out. I decided to go for Bite first against Ivysaur this time for the 30% chance to flinch. We don't get it, but Ivysaur misses Sleep Powder and we take him out with a follow-up Mega Kick. The battle is ours from there, so my mind was already thinking about our next gym leader, Lieutenant Surge, who we do have a type disadvantage against. Let's check him out. Usually when I'm playing these runs, I am teaching Dig to my Meowth as it's just such a good utility move throughout the run. We can buy other copies of Dig later from the department store in Celadon, so I have not taught it yet, instead waiting to see if I needed it for Roshi. I wasn't 100% sure on our damage ranges here, so I tried using both Water Pulse and Brick Break against Voltorb to see what's doing more damage. The answer is Water Pulse, but it's still two shots. I take out Voltorb and Pikachu, making sure to use Water Pulse against Pikachu to avoid making contact. Raichu's first double team makes us miss our first Water Pulse. And thankfully, the super risky Mega Kick hits on the next turn. He spent that turn using Thunder Wave to paralyze us, but our held Cherry Berry fixes that problem. Speaking of making contact though, that Mega Kick also activated Raichu's static ability, so we're paralyzed anyway. Raichu then hits a stab super effective shockwave taking us to 10 health, but we hit through the paralysis, ending the battle. Seems that we did not need Dig this time, however, I could definitely see that being a possibility in the next run. On the next route, I'm just focused on picking up a few items that I find to be useful. Obviously, the hidden rare candies, but there's also a hidden super potion and cherry berry just before the entrance to Rock Tunnel. The super potion is nice, but cherry berries save lives. Then, on the other side of the tunnel, I'm grabbing one of those staple items from Gen 3, TM27 Return. Like I mentioned before, we're going to be relying a lot on Roshi's special abilities, however, having a little bit of physical coverage is super useful. I was definitely hoping for something better than Mega Kick for the upcoming grass type, so I teach it immediately. Then after a quick clearing of the rocket hideout, we're level 35, and once again, I am going to be grabbing the coin case. For the first time in a few weeks though, we're actually gonna use it. Twice. We're also level 35 right now, so after knocking out a couple of trainers in Erica's gym... We are ready to evolve once more. Who needs a big fancy tail when you can have cannons on your back? Blastoise is so freaking cool, oh my goodness. I was hoping that this evolution would power us up enough to be able to take on Erica. Let's see. Speaking of our saviors, aka Cherry Berries, we have one equipped against her lead Victory Bell. Our return seems to be just doing half damage as she lands a Stun Spore, activating our Berry, and we can take out Victory Bell on the next turn. Tangela just kinda sits there like a pile of wet spaghetti, but it's against Vile Plume that we see why Erica could be a problem. I went for Bite, hoping for flinches since we are faster, but she paralyzes us on the first turn. Then she starts unleashing a barrage of stab super effective Giga Drains, recovering herself as I try my best to hit through with returns. Things get real close with Roshi in red bar at only 20 health, but we hit through and end the battle. I feel like this battle definitely carried with it a bit more risk than was worth it. I have plans for that coin case after all, so maybe in the next playthrough when we come to grab our treat from the game corner, that's the time to beat Erica. Our next major battle leads us back to Lavender Town and Pokemon Tower. We've upgraded ourselves a huge amount, but the rival doesn't really see his big upgrade until the next battle. Our Water Pulse is now able to one-shot Pidgeotto without the critical. Then our return against Ivysaur does not get the one-shot, but it's so nice to see a stab super effective overgrow boosted Razor Leaf pretty much bounce off of us. The double Intimidate on the Venusaur team is also going to discourage us from physical moves in the future. Our damage output against Gyarados is not going to get any better. Rival 4 falls, continuing with the Rocket plotline into Sylphco next. It feels like it's been a long time since I did a full item collection in Sylphco, but I am absolutely going for one today. I want that Game Corner treat, and I want it as quickly as possible. I felt that Roshi was going to need a little bit of training throughout the run, so I didn't mind knocking out a couple of additional trainers along the way, especially like this juggler who gives a few special attack EVs. Another nice thing about this juggler Dalton battle is that we level up to 42 learning Rain Dance. 
Rain Dance is available as a TM, but it's very nice to learn it naturally as it gives us a little bit of moveset flexibility. Given that the TM is still sitting in the world, we can easily delete this move and then reteach it later if we need to. While it's raining, our water damage will be increased by one and a half times, and I wonder if this is going to help us out against the much more powerful Rival 5. Against his lead Pidgeot, we start off with a pair of dances. Me for the rain, him for the feathers. Even with the increased damage, Water Pulse does not deal enough to one-shot Pidgeot, but we take him out without issue. The problem with that Dance of Feathers, though, is that our attack is reduced, so I cannot rely on Return against Venusaur. Bite is doing pretty sad damage, and once Venusaur decides to go on the offense, we cannot stand up for very long. Fair enough, but there are other upgrades down in Fuchsia City that I have my eye on. Before heading to Fuchsia, though, I do have to stop at the department store. I sold all of the items that we collected in Sylph and anything else that was redundant. At 96k, we have a fair amount of flexibility, and you can see me pausing here and there as I decide how much money I can spend. The lovely little treat that I want from the game corner costs 80,000, but I definitely want these vitamins as well. I figured that with the money that we'll make down in Fuchsia, I can buy a single Carbos and two Calciums and still be fine. This puts us at the vitamin cap for speed and almost at that cap for special attack. Fingers crossed that my math wasn't wrong on this one. Down in Fuchsia, in the Safari Zone, I'm picking up a couple of those items that I'm relying on for cash. We don't need the protein, we don't need these TMs, but hey, it's a little bit of extra money. Our reward for finding the secret house at the end of the Safari Zone is HM3 Surf, easily what I consider to be the best water move in the entire game. Let's see how much that upgrade helps us against our next gym leader, Koga. I did not want to deal with any accuracy nonsense from coughing, and luckily Stab Surf is able to one-shot his lead. Muck definitely has a lot more special defense, so I decided to set up the rain. Turns out that this was completely unnecessary, as our Surf drops him into Red Bar. After a couple of turns, including getting poisoned and triggering our Pecha Berry, we managed to take him down, but without the rain. Doing more damage is great, but a two-shot is a two-shot is a two-shot. His next coughing falls. And I was doubting our one-shot against Weezing, going for Bite first, again hoping for a flinch. We don't get it, but he can't really do much to us, and a final Stab Surf ends the battle. Alright, we get 4300 from defeating Koga, plus the TMs, carry the one... Actually, why am I bothering to do math right now? Let's just go sell stuff and see what happens. After selling our items and flying back to Celadon, we have... 1,000 Poké Dollars in excess. Heck yeah, so after spending all of our money on coins, I pop next door to buy TM13 Ice Beam. I wonder if this is gonna help us against Venusaur. I will also mention that after defeating the Gym Challenge, I will pop back here to pick up the Mystic Water. I'll tell you that now so that I don't have to bother showing it later. Let's pop back into Sylph and check out that Rival 5 battle. I decided to test out if Ice Beam was worth using against Bird Brains as well. And, well, I don't really find out as we get a critical, taking it out in a single shot. Venusaur comes out and Ice Beam knocks him down almost perfectly into Overgrow range. All starters have a similar ability, Overgrow for Grass types, Blaze for Fire types, and Torrent for Water types. When below one-third health, it increases the damage of your Grass, Fire, and Water moves respectively by one and a half times. In this battle though, it's an absolute stomp fest. Venusaur misses his Sleep Powder and Ice Beam takes him out. Gyarados though serves to remind us that we have some hard opponents in the future. We don't have great options in a mirror match situation, and most of the time that's going to be against Gyaradoses who were also dropping our attack stat. Ice Beam does good, but it could be better. Rival 5 falls, so let's keep collecting some gym badges. Sabrina is next. We have a pretty good physical move, and we're reasonably fast, so Sabrina should be pretty straightforward. Return carves through her Kadabra and Mr. Mime, but then misses the one-shot against Venomoth. She gets a little bit cheeky, confusing us as we hit ourselves, but it's okay because we take out Venomoth, bringing out the Ace Alakazam. Return then misses the one-shot, leaving Alakazam at some pixel value of health. She heals, and a Surf then leaves her in Red Bar once again. She then heals again, and Return leaves her with a Sliver again. On the next turn, Sabrina accepts her fate, getting taken out by one final return. We now have six badges and a type advantage against the last two. Next on Cinnabar Island, I decided to do a little bit of grinding. 
We're not quite done spending money yet, and Blaine's Gym is chock full of cash, good experience, and speed EVs. I'm not entirely convinced that the speed EVs were necessary, but I did feel that we needed a little bit of grinding, and this felt like the fastest place to do it. After defeating the first trainer, I decided, hmm, I'm gonna be using Surf a lot. So I just bit the bullet using all three of the PP ups that I've collected to this point to max out Surf's PP. I find myself wondering if PP ups are blue. We are, after all, now sporting a very virile PowerPoint total on a move that makes things very wet. Uh, I'm stopping now before this spirals. Let's check out Blaine. Against our seventh gym leader, I really don't have much to say. So let's just sit back, relax, and enjoy Stab's super effective surf absolutely dismantling an entire team. Absolutely zero thought process went into this battle aside from A, 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 we won. That is an easy seventh badge. We're then off to the Sevi Islands to help out Blaine and Celio, and again, there isn't really much to talk about in this section. I don't plan on doing any additional grinding here or in Giovanni's gym, so we can jump straight into our final gym battle so that we can target those leagues where everything will be determined. Once again, we're faced with a gym battle where I have nothing to say. Surf is in my number one spot, so I don't have to use the D-pad or anything, it's just another case of a a a a a Oh, you can't argue with results there, eh? Since that summarizes this battle, let's not focus on Pokémon and focus on me. A little bit of training that I do for myself as a creator is tongue twisters. I really enjoy them to try and keep my speech as clear as possible. Did you know that Betty Botter bought some butter? But she said the butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter, but a bit of better butter will make my batter better. So twas better Betty Botter bought a bit of better butter. <laughs> How can you not have fun saying that? Giovanni falls and with him the gym challenge, leaving one final trainer before the leagues, Rival 6. Speaking of that raw power that Roshi possesses, I just want to point out that we are the same level as the rival's ace in this battle. I set up the rain against Pidgeot, though I feel that this was a little bit unnecessary. Surf one shots, and then Ice Beam handles Venusaur in two more shots. From there, once again, the battle pretty much falls apart for our rival. Including a critical against his Gyarados, we see a successful battle in the first attempt. At an equivalent level, we just beat up an entire team. Also, as I mentioned earlier, before we pop into the leagues, I am going to be heading back to Celadon to grab that Mystic Water from the game corner. There's nothing left to talk about, so let's jump in to the Round 1 Elite Four. Unfortunately, our first battle in the league is gonna be a Water Mirror match against the Ice Trainer. Yeah, Gen 1 Remake's gonna Gen 1. It becomes quite clear that we're not gonna be taking a lot of damage in this battle, however, we are not dealing a lot of damage in this battle. We're still at an equivalent level, but when we're facing a team where every single one of her five members is a slugfest, Roshi doesn't do very well. It actually only took this one reset to prompt me to go and grind in Victory Road, so be right back. I pretty much cleared the entirety of Victory Road, coming back into the battle at level 61. Now that we're over two damage rounding thresholds, you can see that we're doing much better damage against Dugong, but it's still a three shot. The really nice one to see is that Slowbro is in fact a two-shot now. Slowbro loves setting up a bunch of amnesia and using Yawn, so getting her out of the way was really nice. Unfortunately, with Lovely Kiss and Attract, Jinx does troll even better than Slowbro. Level 61 is not gonna cut it, I'm afraid. So what's it gonna take to get through this battle? Here we are five resets later and I've dipped into our rare candies using seven to level up to level 68 over three more damage rounding thresholds. I felt confident enough in Roshi's abilities that using these rare candies now did not feel preemptive. I hope. Something else that I've changed has actually been setting up Rain Dance against Cloyster. In the rain, even resisted, this gives us much better damage output against Slowbro. She ends up getting off a little bit of shenanigans against us, but we take her out, but against Jinx, ugh, it's beautiful. Jinx caused so many of those resets just to sleep and attract, so when we hit through with return and get a critical for the one shot, mwah. I'm also now wearing a Personberry, as there was more than one unfortunate reset to confusion luck against Lapras. That concludes the first Elite Four member, though. Here's hoping that things get a little easier. 
against Bruno No No? Oh yeah. With our speed where it is right now, we can actually take a Rock Tomb and still outspeed the majority of his team. I delete his lead Onyx with a stab, four times super effective Surf. Then against Hitmonchan, I take one of those Rock Tombs, reducing our speed to 113. I used the turn to set up Rain Dance, and so now we're set up to sweep through the rest of his team with Stab Rain Boosted Surf. At 113 speed, we actually speed tie his Hitmonlee, but everything else falls in short order. That was a wicked easy second battle. Agatha is next. I had it equipped in the last battle, though I didn't mention my Mystic Water. While held, it powers up our water moves by 10%. Like we needed any more boosts to our water moves, I decided to keep the Mystic Water on as her lead Gengar has a tendency to go for double teams. That's what happens here, and then Rain Boosted Surf takes out her following four Pokémon in a single shot each, again outspeeding all of them. Actually, at level 69, nice, we have 173 speed, which ties the fastest Pokémon in this league, Aerodactyl. With the way our experience is lining up, though, I'm predicting that by the time we get to Aerodactyl, we'll be leveled up, and it won't be a problem. The rain ends on the last turn of battle, but all that's left is Haunter, and one final Stab Surf takes it out. Lance is next. Against Lance in round one, we see a similar battle to what played out against Giovanni and Blaine. This time, instead of relying heavily on Surf to get all of our work done for us, I scream, you scream, we all scream for Ice Beam. We face the greatest threat against his lead Gyarados with six Ice Beams, including the heal, being needed to take him down. From there, though, we're fine. Super effective Ice Beam takes out both of his Dragonairs, followed by a four times super effective Ice Beam for Dragon Knight. We also leveled up to 70 during the battle, so our speed is now 176, outspeeding Aerodactyl with one final stab super effective Surf, bringing him down. Lance falls, leaving only the champion in round one. I kick off this battle by seeing how much Ice Beam is doing against Bird Brains. A clean one-shot is how it's doing, booyah. Venusaur is next, setting up a single growth while two Ice Beams take him out as well. Alakazam is next, and I decided for a little bit of safety with the rest of the battle to set up a Rain Dance. His Psychic pretty much just bounces off of us, probably because he was so intimidated by the size of our cannons. And after a heal, a Rain Boosted Surf brings him down. Rhydon falls as well, and then while the rain is still active, I decide to keep going with Surf against Gyarados. We just barely miss the one-shot, leaving Gyarados again at some fraction of a pixel as the rain ends. Three more uses of Ice Beam bring down Gyarados, but we only have 50 health for his final Arcanine. Our nature is reducing our defense, and Arcanine has extreme speed... And we survive with 16 health, so our stab, super effective, torrent boosted surf brings down the fire doggo. And there goes the battle. I would just like to point out that after defeating Lorelei, we one shot every single member of that league. You're my boy, Blue! Roshi clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 54 seconds at level 71 with 10 resets. This took 4 hours and 19 minutes of game time. There isn't much to discuss between the leagues aside from showing you the same things that I've showed you a million times before. The leftovers are going to be fantastic for Roshi, and then I also skip down to grab an extra rare candy just in case. I'm hoping that Lorelei does not give us as many problems this time because there are other league members that are definitely more concerning this time. Also, I did not mean to hit that extra trainer there. Whoops. There's nothing left to discuss, so we can jump right back into the leagues. Let's check out round two. Along with team and moveset changes, all League members have been powered up by about 12 levels. We're faced immediately with that slugfest that is Lorelei. A super unfortunate bit is that Dugong loves going for double team this time, which makes her lead even more of a slugfest, potentially. She sends out her Lapras second, but in round two, Lapras knows Thunder. Blastoise is strong, but not tanking multiple Thunder strong. I decided to jump right back into the battle and see if we could get a little bit more lucky. Thunder, after all, only has 70% accuracy, but what's about to unfold is a little ludicrous. 
She hits her first thunder, but in the subsequent four that follow, she does not connect again. One out of five thunders actually connected. Once her ace Lapras is out of the way, we can carve through the rest of her team with relative ease. Surf for Cloyster with its abysmal special defense, surf for Piloswine because it's super effective, and one final rain-boosted surf brings down Jinx. You know, I could admit that this battle was super lucky, but I'm gonna take it. I'm just writing down real quick, Lorelei, round two, Lapras, Thunder, bad. Against Bruno, we're gonna see an easier battle than round one. His Onyxes have been upgraded to Steelixes, but Stab Super Effective Surf does not care. We take out his lead in a single shot, bringing out Hitmonchan next. One of Hitmonchan's big upgrades was getting his Rock Tomb replaced by Rock Slide. Whatever, hit me while I set up the rain. At 188 speed, the only thing in this league that outspeeds us again is Lance's Aerodactyl at 208. Stab, Rain Boosted Surfs deal with his fighters, with a super effective addition dealing with his final Steelix. If only Lorelei wasn't so much better, I feel like Roshi would be doing much better. Bruno falls, Agatha is next. This is a pretty cool battle for one reason. Against Lorelei, I had the leftovers equipped, Bruno, I had the Mystic Water, and now against Agatha, it's a Lumberry. The Lumberry essentially gives us one get out of jail free turn for us to set up Rain Dance with. The Lumberry cures Gengar's Hypnosis, and then we start carving through with Rain Boosted Surf. Then against Arbok, I really wish I still had that Mystic Water, as he's left with a Sliver. What is with Blastoise in this run leaving things at Slivers? My goodness. With her ace Gengar, who's equipped with Thunderbolt still in the back, I decided to set up an additional Rain Dance. This results in us taking a Sludge Bomb, which also gets a Poison, because me. With Roshi's Fantastic Bulk, though, we pretty much just shrug it off and can one-shot our way through the rest of the battle. I think this is the case in many battles that I've fought, but the Poison damage does significantly more than anything else. Our next opponent is Lance, and he's developed some new challenge since round one. Lance's lead Gyarados lives to paralyze you right off the bat, so I have a Cherry Berry equipped. Unfortunately, our Ice Beam again is only doing about a third. The Cherry Berry is only going to protect us from paralysis for one turn, and needing three to bring down Gyarados results in us being paralyzed. As only Lance's second Pokémon comes out, knocking us down into Red Bar, we do take out the Ace Dragonite, but I'm just going to reset. Paralysis is just too much to deal with. After a couple of attempts, I've decided to switch my strategy. Actually, I changed my strategy immediately, I just had a little bit of bad luck being fully paralyzed and a critical. These days, I'm coming into the battle with a Chesto Berry, and I've taught Rest over Return. It was a little bit tough getting rid of our physical coverage, but I don't think that we're gonna need it in these last two battles. I can take out Gyarados, and then on the first turn against his Ace Dragonite, he goes for Thunderbolt while I heal. Rest takes us to full health, and then the Chesto Berry wakes us up. You gotta love the Resto Chesto. Four times super effective Ice Beams hammer his dragons, but against Kingdra, we have a little bit of trouble. Ice Beam is neutral and is not doing the greatest damage ever, but we run out of power points. Surf is gonna be four times resisted by the Water Dragon type, so I set up a Rain Dance to try and offset that. We bring down Kingdra, but just like in round one, I'm now faced with a hard-hitting physical attacker with not a lot of health left. Aerodactyl goes for Hyper Beam and misses! I feel the only appropriate response there is nah -ha. Stab, super effective, rain-boosted, torrent-boosted surf washes away Aerodactyl. That leaves us with one final challenge to complete, the round two champion. All right, this battle. Barring a 6.25% chance critical, I don't see us taking out Heracross in a single shot. This is going to expose us to a Rock Tomb and a Speed Drop in pretty much every battle. Worse yet is that after that Rock Tomb, Heracross now outspeeds us, hitting a massive Stab Megahorn. We take out his lead, but we're already reduced to about a third. 
Tyranitar comes out, activating Sandstream and cancelling the healing from our leftovers, and it seems that Stab's super effective Surf is just missing the mark against him. Meanwhile, his Thunderbolts are hitting for a lot of damage, and after he heals, I just decided to reset. Something needs to go different here. After a couple of attempts, Heracross still lands his Rock Tomb, but missed Megahorn, so I got away with green health. I've started tanking a single Thunderbolt from Tyranitar in order to set up the rain. It comes with a 30% chance of being paralyzed, but hey, it boosts our water moves and gets rid of that sandstorm so our leftovers can continue healing us. Oh, and I've used our remaining rare candies to level up to 83 over 3 more damage rounding thresholds. Against Venusaur though, it's that speed drop from Heracross that does us in. He's faster setting up the sunlight while Ice Beam does some heavy damage. I'm not sure why he goes for Sludge Bomb instead of Solar Beam after setting up the sunlight, but even so, he ends up getting the poison. I decided for whatever reason to get the rainfall set back up, and it just falls apart. Alakazam comes out outspeeding and ending the battle with a Stab Psychic. Nine resets after our first attempt, and I think I have a winning strategy. A good one is debatable, but a winning one nonetheless. Rest was not doing us any favors in this battle, so I replaced it with Earthquake. Also, the vast majority of those resets are simply fishing for a Rock Tomb miss from Heracross. It's not my favorite way of doing things, but with our speed reduced, this battle is not possible. Not without leaving to do an excessive amount of grinding anyway. I use the same strategy that we've already discussed to get past Tyranitar, so let's look at Venusaur. With our speed intact, Ice Beam does a ton of damage while he sets up the sun, and then a follow-up Ice Beam takes him out. Speed really does make that much of a difference for a solo runner. In the sunlight, the power of our Surf is reduced, so I switch to Earthquake for Alakazam. This is why I wanted that little bit of physical coverage. Gyarados is out next, and just like every other Gyarados we faced in the leagues, he's gonna take three Ice Beams to bring down. He gets a little scary though as he sets up two Dragon Dances, so on the third turn he now outspeeds. Gyarados then hits a plus two critical Hyper Beam, bringing us down to 65 health. Again, I'm gonna mention that we have a minus defense nature. Roshi, you're awesome. All we need is for Arcanine not to crit, and he doesn't, with Stab's super effective Torrent Boosted Surf ending the battle. As we walk towards the Hall of Fame, I find myself wondering about the second playthrough. To be honest, Blastoise does not have great egg move options, but are we really gonna need them? Roshi clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 38 minutes, and 32 seconds at level 83 with 23 resets. This took 5 hours and 19 minutes of game time. So let's think about that egg move choice for a second. Like I said, I don't feel that Squirtle has the greatest options, so let's investigate them. Mirror Coat might be useful against something like Surge's Raichu, but we can two-shot him anyway. I was thinking that there might be some cool way of incorporating Flail with Torrent Strats, but that's pretty risky and not very reliable. Then I thought maybe Haze to get rid of Intimidate attack drops or speed drops from Rock Tombs. But at the end of the day, I went with Yawn. Yawn is going to be a fairly reliable way of putting opponents to sleep, and although we're not going to need it much, it might add a bit of consistency, at least to the early part of the run. For the second playthrough as well, I've stuck with our mild nature, as once again we're going to be relying on that special attack. Our path through Viridian Forest remains identical to last run, defeating only the mandatory Bugcatcher Sammy on the way through. One change that I'm making in the early game is that in Brock's Gym, I'm also defeating the optional Camper Liam. Speaking of difficult early game battles, we have Rival 2 looming in the future, and I wanted to try and get at least a little extra experience. Brock then falls super easily to the power of Stab Super Effective Bubble. Then, on the way through Mount Moon, I'm defeating a couple of additional trainers, including Hiker Marcos, again for that extra experience aiming for Rival 2. On the other side of the cave, after a quick antidote and potion, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil. And all day and all night, everything he sees is just blue, like him. I need to find a new blue song. Just outside of the cave, I'm making sure to teach only Mega Kick this time. I felt that Mega Kick was the more attractive one, as it has that higher damage output, and we do have Bite. Once we're in Cerulean, I once again target Misty first, where I should have used Yawn in this first attempt. Mega Kick just misses the mark here as we leave Starmie in Red Bar. As a result of this, the battle drags on for a few too many turns and Wartortle ends up falling for the first reset of the run. 
On the next attempt, I make sure to put Starmie to sleep with Yawn first, but then we just get a critical strike with Bite, taking her out in one shot. Oh, RNG, you're so silly. We're then facing Rival 2, where the inconsistency of Mega Kick reveals itself once more. We end up taking a single sand attack from Bird Brains before dropping him, but then against his ace Bulbasaur, things go badly. Between being asleep and not being able to hit a Mega Kick to save our lives, we get taken out for a second reset. On the next attempt though, Bulbasaur stays asleep and we see a successful battle. Another change I'm making is that on Route 25, I am pulling down Camper Flint in order to grab TM43's secret power. After the shenanigans I faced with Mega Kick, I want the higher accuracy, please. Then it's a quick shot south, of course, grabbing our army of Meowths along the way. Which hidden power typing would you go with in Blastoise's second run? To me, there was only one answer, but let's see if you know me well enough by now. The item collection on the SSN remains the same, skipping rest this time and defeating Rival 3. Because I felt that we got a little bit lucky in our last Surge battle, I was holding on to Dig this time in case we needed it. His Raichu is able to lay some pain on us, but like I said, we're able to two-shot him as well. That's a battle that can fall apart in a lot of ways, but we're fine once again. Suddenly, we're in the mid-game. Nothing changed from the last playthrough between Lieutenant Surge and Giovanni in the Rocket Hideout. Now, it's time to start making a couple of changes, though. I'm still running down to grab the coin case, however, I will not be facing Erica this time, and I think my routing with the coin case spending is a little bit better this time. Including that little bit of extra training and catching our army of Meowths, we're actually slightly behind the first run at this point. Don't worry, though. This egghead has a plan. After grabbing the coin case, I then head back north and east to Saffron. I know that max repels are not as money efficient as super repels, but my routing really likes max repels. Since money really isn't an issue most of the time in these runs, what do you think? Should I keep going with my max repels, or should I switch to supers? I also like this shopping location because it's the first access to hyper potions and full heals that you get. Our next major battle is against Rival 3, where I'll discuss a small change that I made. As a side effect of running with our army of Meowths aiming for a pickup of TM10, we also get a ton of berries along the way. Because it's all RNG based, you can't expect to have the berries that you need all the time, but I felt pretty confident in being a little bit more liberal with them. One of the biggest problems we faced with this Ivysaur is the fact that he continuously tries to put us to sleep. A few bad turns of sleep means a reset most of the time, so I have a Chesto Berry equipped in this battle. Also, as a hint for my HP typing, I want you to investigate this battle. Which Pokémon do we take the most turns against, and which HP typing would deal with it? In my first playthrough as well, I was tagged by quite a few spinners as I was going through the region, so this time after Rival 4, it's time to evolve to Blastoise. Yes, I did skip Wartotal's evolution, but what can I say? I'm excited to show you this run. Powered up and with Sylphco in our sights next, it's time for that next little bit of routing changing. In Sylphco itself, I'm following pretty much the same route, collecting all of the items. Because Blastoise does need a little bit of additional training throughout the run, I don't mind tagging a few extra trainers along the way that give special attack EVs. Any trainers with Kadabra or the Magnemite line are A-OK -okay by me right now. Although after collecting our items, I do not attempt Rival 5, instead heading straight to the department store to buy our vitamins. This time I am absolutely maxing out our Calcium and our Carbos for speed. I'm not 100% convinced that the Carbos were necessary, but I was intending to take a Rock Tomb in the Bruno fights again. As such, we don't need a huge amount of speed, but we definitely need a nice little buffer. A second reason why I don't know if the Carboses were necessary is because I am going to be doing a little bit of training for Speed EVs. Cycling Road is packed with attack and defense EVs, neither of which interest me very much. It's funny, you know, on my recent stream, somebody mentioned how Fearow is one of the most forgettable Pokémon. As somebody who runs by this patch of grass and these trainers at least a couple of times a week, I would disagree. But hey, not everybody spends as much time in Fire Red as I do. After a ton of misses against Muck, Koga falls next. But this time, instead of going back to Sylph, I'm actually pivoting down to Cinnabar Island. This is going to be one of the most interesting gym badge layouts that I've had in a while. Also, by the splits right now, we're like 11 minutes behind, but don't worry. It's because of the routing changing, not because I suck. Then I defeat every trainer in Blaine's gym for a few reasons. First off, of course, experience, because we do need a little bit of grinding in this run. Second is that Blaine's gym is absolutely packed with more speed EVs. 
And third is that many of the trainers in Blaine's gym give a handsome purse upon defeating them. I feel like this whole process can be summarized just by showing the Blaine battle because yeah, Stab Surf just wins. We're even at a lower level this time, and it still doesn't matter, we just one-shot everything. Then it's off to the Sevi Islands, not doing any additional training, but still picking up a few of those useful items like the hidden rare candy behind the house on Two Island. Oh, honey, honey, ba 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 you are my candy turtle! This diversion in the routing from last run then allows us to fly back to Celadon, and we have 101,000 Poké Dollars in our pocket. What this allows us to do is run into the game corner purchasing not 4,000, but 5,000 coins. That way I can head next door and grab both Ice Beam and the Mystic Water, as we are going to be using both. The idea here was to minimize the amount of backtracking I had to do, however, some egghead then forgets to go down and defeat Erica. Now that we have Ice Beam, this would have been a prime time to do it, but let's head to Sylph, I guess. Rival 5 was definitely one of the stickier battles that we faced last time, but check it out this time. Bird Brains, one shot. Venusaur, one shot. Gyarados, two shot, but we also get a freeze. Growlithe, one shot, and finally Alakazam, one shot. It doesn't get any more cut and dry than that, so let's jump into Sabrina's gym for a bit of additional training. It's few and far between that I actually take the time to defeat all of the trainers in Sabrina's gym, but they are worth a fair amount of special attack EVs. From the drowsy and slowpoke lines, we're also absorbing some defensive EVs, so they're useful too, I guess. I have to admit though, after just whipping through this gym for the last several months, I had to look up a map to figure out how to get to all of them effectively. Sabrina is a series of one-shots, and then, um, level 54, Ice Beam, Erica. Nuff said. I then shoot straight to Giovanni without any additional training, and finish the gym challenge. You'll see the splits at the end, but including all of those fluctuations in routing, we're actually still 17 seconds slower than last run right now, but we are much better set up for the upcoming leagues. Our last battle before those is Rival 6, where I'm going to be able to reveal our HP typing. Going hard into our special attack once again, Surf, Ice Beam, and HP Electric felt like the best possible coverage. That means that when Gyarados pops out, we can just one-shot him instead of getting thrashed about a bunch. After this battle, we then do our last bit of training in Victory Road, aiming to be level 62. From level 62, I then use 8 rare candies, leveling up to 70 for the Lorelei battle. Let's jump in. At level 70 with HP Electric, you can see a much different battle to last time. We're able to two-shot the majority of her team with HP Electric, and the additional levels were actually for the Lapras. First though, after taking out Dugong against Cloyster, I do make sure to take a turn to set up Rain Dance. This just so happens to cancel the hail, should it be on the field, but it serves another purpose. I also have a Chesto Berry equipped in case Slowbro decides to get a little yawny. She goes for Surf this time, so no problem there, and then with the rain up, our rain-boosted stab Surf can one-shot Jinx. I cannot express how many times Jinx took me out in testing by simply sitting there for like, 10 turns doing nothing between Attract and Sleep. We finally get to her Ace Lapras, and at level 70, our HP Electric is doing more than half damage. I needed to be doing more than half damage because Lapras holds a Citrus Berry, and after it activates, our damage output at level 70 is high enough for the two-shot. There goes probably the most complicated of the League members. Against Bruno, I hope you don't mind hyper-accelerated footage, because there's nothing to say here. We follow the exact same strategy as last time, taking our one Rock Tomb and winning the battle. This is one of those moments where I doubt the purchase of those Carbos because our speed is 116. Our speed at that level is just kind of in a hinterland between being perfectly effective and not effective at all. Oh well, I tried my best. Bruno falls, Agatha is next. Agatha again is going to be very similar to last time. I have that same Chesto Berry equipped all the way since Lorelei because I didn't need anything special for Bruno. I set up the rain and start sweeping through her team. The sharp-eyed among you may have noticed during the Lorelei battle that I had accidentally reduced one reset. Don't worry, it was back by Bruno, we can just blame my chubby fingers for that one. 
I know that's not very relevant to this Agatha battle, but shucks, I needed something to talk about. At this level, her Ace Gengar is actually a range which we miss, but then she misses Hypnosis, and again, the battle is no problem. The rain fades, we finish off her Ace Gengar, followed by her Haunter, and there goes the battle. Ooh, but Lance plays out much differently, let me show you. Time to have some fun. Four times super effective HP Electric deletes Gyarados. Then super effective Ice Beams tear through his following two Dragonairs. With that same Ice Beam now dealing four times super effective damage against his Ace Dragonite. With the additional levels we needed earlier in the league, we also outspeed Aerodactyl with one final stab super effective Surf ending the battle. Ho 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 yeah, that is what good special coverage feels like. The Round 1 Elite Four have fallen, leaving us the Round 1 Champion. We lead off against Bird Brains, and a super effective Critical Ice Beam gets the one-shot. I don't think the crit was necessary. His Ace Venusaur is next, trying to grow up a little bit, but two more uses of super effective Ice Beam handle him as well. Surf misses the one-shot against Alakazam, leaving him in Red Bar as a Psychic pretty much just bounces off of us. No worries, dude. You use a full restore, I'll set up the rain. Stab Rain Boosted Surf, which also happens to get a cheeky critical, then takes out Alakazam. Stab four times super effective Rain Boosted Surf takes out Rhydon, and then mmm mmm mmm. Four times super effective HP Electric levels Gyarados. Arcanine is last, and of course we wash him away with one final surf. The round one champion has fallen. As we make our way to the Hall of Fame, I can see how our splits are looking right now, but I'm gonna leave you in suspense. Just remember that we did finish the Gym Challenge 17 seconds slower. Blastoise clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 6 minutes, and 18 seconds at level 73 with 2 resets. This took 4 hours and 11 minutes of game time. Between the leagues, nothing changes, but I do want to take a moment to discuss those max repels again. As we head through the ice path in order to collect Waterfall, my step counter just happens to line up perfectly. This is pretty much every run, by the way, where I'm able to pick up Waterfall and immediately after our Repel expires. So in order to save on time menuing, I'm now able to reapply the Repel and teach Waterfall in one fell swoop. I'm not sure how much time something like this actually saves, but it does feel nice from a routing perspective. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's jump in to the Round 2 Leagues. This time against Lorelei, things are going to go a little bit differently. HP Electric once again gives us all of the damage that we need in order to survive this fight, but there's a couple of other quirks. Her Ace Lapras, who if you recall knows Thunder this time, comes out second. There was no good way that I could find around getting hit by a Thunder, so that's why I have a Cherry Berry equipped. In testing, the only resets that really existed in this battle were from Lapras. Either she would crit with Thunder, which was unavoidable, or she would get the 30% chance for a Paralysis. If we end up paralyzed, the battle doesn't go very well from there. One final point is that against Cloyster, I am again setting up the rain in order to one-shot Jinx. And there goes the battle. Once again, we have a fairly easy victory against arguably one of the most challenging members for Blastoise to face. Bruno, on the other hand, once again, nothing changes from last run. I take out his lead Steelix immediately with a stab, super effective Surf, and then against Hitmonchan, I set up the rain. Rock Slide or Rock Tomb here does not matter. We definitely could have afforded to lose a single stage of speed. I have switched my item back out to the Mystic Water as it guarantees the one shot against Machamp. But that's it for this battle. Sorry, Bruno. Sucks to suck, buddy. Now against Agatha, again we're going to be seeing a very similar battle to last run. I have a Lumberry equipped this time, setting up the rain while her lead Gengar puts us to sleep and the berry activates. In order to have something to talk about, let's discuss those rare candies that I burned before this league. I used 9 before round 1 and 6 before this league, so that's a total of 15. 13 from the region and 2 from our Meowths. Getting 1 to 2 additional rare candies from my army of Meowths, depending on how much grinding I'm doing, is pretty typical. Agatha's round 2 team lines up beautifully, because once the rain fades and our Surf is no longer powered up, it's her Crobat who she sends out last. 
Crobat is weak to Ice Beam, so with an effective power of 190, we can take him out in a single shot as well. Easy peasy, let's check out that Dragon Doctoral. What's this? I don't have any held item? In hindsight, this may have been a little bit foolish, but I was feeling pretty confident after that last Lance battle. Four times super effective HP Electric makes Gyarados go away, with, of course, four times super effective Ice Beams taking out his following two Dragonites. Oh, you gotta love it. Against Kingdra, though, we do see a spot of bother. For the life of me, I cannot get these damage ranges to line up, and Kingdra just keeps on powering up with Dragon Dance. Fortunately for me, Lance is kind of a dum dum. After setting up some Dragon Dances, he tags me with a couple of Surfs, which use his special stats and are resisted. Oh, Lance. It feels like it takes a short eternity, but Kingdra eventually falls, and at 212 speed, we also outspeed Aerodactyl. Stab, super effective Surf, ends the battle. This leaves Blastoise with a single challenger remaining, the Round 2 Champion. Against the champion, I had a tough decision to make. Remember that I'm always pursuing the fastest possible completion time, and sometimes that just means fishing for a lucky outcome. All I need is for Heracross to miss a Rock Tomb, a 1 in 5 chance. So with 1 in 5 odds, how many does it take for him to miss one? That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh my goodness, finally, on the ninth try, he finally misses Rock Tomb. The reason I needed this miss is because we cannot survive this battle with our speed reduced. Without leveling all the way up to pretty much 100, I didn't have a way of one-shotting Heracross reliably. So it was a toss-up between a ton of additional grinding or fishing for a 20% chance outcome on the first turn of a battle. With that miss, we can take out Heracross in two shots with Surf and then Tyranitar in one more. Venusaur is typically a two-shot relying on him to change the weather, but this time we get the critical, taking him out in one. That's fine though, against Alakazam, the plan was to change the weather to rain anyway. This powers up our water moves and cancels that darn sandstorm so our held leftovers can finally start healing us again. Was that super necessary though? Eh. As Surf takes out Alakazam, followed by four times super effective HP Electric for Gyarados, and one final rain boosted Stab Surf for Arcanine. Oh, it was super effective too. Did I mention it was super effective? Four times Stab Super Effective Surf. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just get a little excited sometimes. Overall, I'd say that this second playthrough went quite well. It was kind of cool to solve a run where our egg move didn't completely redefine everything. Blastoise clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 22 minutes, and 12 seconds at level 86 with 10 resets. This took 5 hours and 5 minutes of game time. So let's check out how much time we were able to save between runs. Like I said, it was kind of fun routing something that wasn't entirely changed by the egg move. I feel like in our first playthrough, we got incredibly lucky in some key spots, and so in our second playthrough, having to do a little bit of additional grinding in the early game definitely impacted our time. I feel like this was justified though, as even when we dipped to almost 11 minutes behind by the fourth badge, it's because we did such a different route. We were also doing a bunch of additional tasks like grinding and catching an army of Meowths. We actually lost time compared to the first run all the way up until that last gym badge like I mentioned, still being 17 seconds behind. But thankfully, at the end of everything, all of that planning and routing changing ended up saving us a fair bit of time. We ended up saving around 8.5 minutes in round 1, and at the end of round 2, we had a total time save of 16 minutes and 20 seconds, 3 levels higher with 13 less resets. I had thought and thought about other ways through Heracross, like HP flying, but then Gyarados is a problem again. I then thought Substitute might be good to defend that speed stat, but we ended up needing all four of our moves pretty consistently throughout the entire league. I just don't see a faster way of Blastoise doing it. On the tier list, this places Blastoise just behind a nice little cluster of legendaries, Raikou, Suicun, and Entei. Now more than ever, I want to rerun those Gen 3 starters using the Egg Move rules. That way we can finally compare which of the starters is the ultimate starter in Fire Red. There's a ton of other Pokémon on the bottom of the list that need re-ranking, but hey, one thing at a time. I also see Tauros and Starmie, they need some more love. 
I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. Your support makes these videos possible so I can continue to put all of my effort into producing this content for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. The channel has surpassed 4,000 subscribers and I just have to take one more moment to thank all of you for your support. Your engagement has pushed this channel to where it is now, so if you feel like I've earned it, leave a like and comment about the run, what you'd like to see in the future, or just to say hi. Balo! I did mention having to re-rank the Gen 3 starters using the egg move rule, but this Squirtle video was the original intended end to the starter series. Or was it? Make sure to tune in next week to figure out just what the heck I'm talking about. Until next time, take care everyone.